Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Get Loved Up podcast. Today, I have an amazing guest for you, Shaman Durek, my brother from another mother. He is so powerful, so engaging, and he is changing the world one day at a time. So let me get into his receipts. Shaman Durek is a sixth-generation shaman author of the bestseller, Spirit Hacking, Shamanic Keys to Reclaim Your Personal Power, Transform Yourself, and Light Up the World, and a visionary for the new age. His focus is on the evolution of humanity and simplifying our lives through common sense. He's redefining what wellness means by putting the power back into people's hands so that they can consciously live their lives authentically and in alignment. Through his powerful ancient teaching, He helps demystify spirituality, making it attainable and understandable for the mainstream audience. Dirk's teaching have impacted thousands of people from diverse public figures like Nina DeVries to Gwyneth Paltrow to tech giants like David Ashbury of Bulletproof Coffee. And he is known as the first spirit shaman to be featured in the People magazine. Shaman Durek's work has been recognized globally by major mainstream publications like Elle, Mary Claire, and Los Angeles Times. He's even been seen in the Evening Standard, U Magazine, The Times, and featured on prominent health and wellness podcasts across the world. He has a recurring role on the CBS show, The Doctors, where they profile his expertise in helping people deal with emotional and mental challenges that affect their physical well-being. Shaman Durek's online shaman school and widely popular show Ancient Wisdom Today are instrumental in helping people tap into their personal power and unblocking the negative patterns that keep them from reaching optimal human performance. Shaman Durek, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Ashe. Amala Ashe. Oh, just reading your accolades, it just makes me so proud because I know that you have been through a lot. This journey becoming a shaman was not easy. So can you just start off? Because we know the greatness that you are. Anyone that sees your books and hears those accolades know that you are showing up in the world in a powerful way. But can you share where you got started in shamanism. In my family, my roots go back from Haiti all the way to Ghana. And my family's lineage comes back from the Yoruba times in West Africa that came all the way over to Haiti and then from Haiti to Nolens. And my great grandmother and her sister and my great grandfather and all of the different lineages of our family, including my dad who was an apprentice, would walk away from it. They were all trained in shamanism. And so it was very much a part of my life. And then on my mother's side, my mother is West Indian and Norwegian. So on her side, on her bloodline, a lot of her family members also were people who worked in uh, speaking to spirits. And, you know, even my great, great, great grandfather was arrested and put into a torture prison because of his abilities to, to help people and to do healing at a time when religion was like, you were not allowed to do those things. So it runs on both sides of my family. Growing up in my home was a very tumultuous experience for me because my parents divorced when I was three. My father, my grandfather had turned the family, took half of the family and turned them away from shamanism and got them more into Catholicism, which comes from Yoruban culture, but then also took from Catholicism into Seven Day Adventists and became this huge Seventh-day Adventist minister. I mean, huge, like on television, you know, uh, laying his hands on people, like all of this stuff. So my dad was kind of stuck in the middle because he grew up training in shamanism with with my great-grandmother and his auntie. And then he later became um, more indoctrinated with my grandfather's belief because he wanted to make his father happy that he would play games where he would like say, yes, I'm doing this, but I'm actually doing this. So it was very contradicting because even though my powers were developing at let's say age four and five years old, when I started getting contacted by the ancestors and asked to do tasks, which is a part of the shamanic initiation, spirits will come to you and say, do this or do this or say this or do this to see if you're loyal to the spirit world 
or do you only believe in what humans say and do only what humans say? Because then if you do, then you can't be a shaman because you're easily programmed and you easily follow the rules of this world. And this world is temporal and the spirit world is eternal. So my devotion is to the spirit world, not the temporal world. And so as a kid, the spirits will test you to see if the elders will send messages to see if you'll deliver the message or do what they ask you to do. So they know that you are a person that they can, they can mold with love to becoming the next shaman in the family. And so those things started when I was about five years old. And uh, for my dad, it was okay. He was okay with everything because I was so young. So he thought maybe I will grow out of it because this is a different world than what he grew up in. And so a lot of my family had to hide shamanism in the Western world from what they were doing in Haiti and Africa because of the stigmatism and, and people judging and saying, oh, you're worshiping the devil, you're doing these things. So they would hide it under the cloak of Catholicism. And that way they would feel more comfortable to say, oh yes, we're Catholic, but by the way, we have a separate house where we bring people in for healings and my grandmother is like, you know, smacking people's bodies and calling on the ancestors and singing and doing everything shamanically. But again, it was hidden. So growing up in a household where my parents divorced, my mom moved to New York, my dad, I ended up staying with my dad with my sister Angelina. And my stepmom comes in from Hawaii, who's Hawaiian Filipino and Japanese. And she was a devout Catholic, very strict, and then literally was afraid of my gifts. And when you're growing up in a household where your father is like dancing to whoever is he's talking to at the moment, it becomes very confusing. Because in one sense, your father is telling you, yes, the spirits are asking you to do things. And yes, I understand what this is. And, you know, and then my aunt comes over and starts training me and teaching me and showing me how to access my abilities. But don't tell your father don't tell him because you have the gift and you're the one in the family who's been given the blessings from the elders, but don't let him know that I'm doing these things because he's going to get mad. But then your father comes in the room and says, Oh, the spirits came to me last night. They told me you're going to take on the family gifts. And then, Oh, his wife is, um, is saying something about Jesus and whatever. And then he's like, you should turn away from those things and, and, and focus on Jesus and the Bible because that's the true path. So, you know, you're getting conflicted. And in that conflicted area, I begin to develop this part of myself that was like, I first need to understand why he's saying that God is angry and God gets jealous. I want to understand the Bible. So I started really spending a lot of time with my grandfather and a lot of time with my grandmother and really understanding what they are talking about and seeing if it's truth. Is there truth? So I would ask questions like, well, if God loves us and God wants us to grow and succeed, why would God punish us? Why wouldn't God give us space to be able to uh, make challenges to refine ourselves so that we can become even greater? How can someone just do as Jesus did without making stumbles and falls and so forth? And the message always was, don't be a sinner, go to church, do as you're told but there was never an answer. And then when I spoke to the side of my family that was the shamanic side, they were always very clear is that being with, with God is a relationship. It's a relationship to the trees. It's a relationship to the flowers. It's a relationship to the sun. It's a relationship to the moon. It's a relationship to other people. It's a relationship to yourselves, to your body, to the food you eat. And the stronger your relationship and the more respect and humbleness and humility you have in that relationship, the stronger your powers will be and the more you'll be of service for humanity. Whereas in my father's, my grandfather's way was if you do what you're told, you go to church, on, you, you follow the Sabbath, which means you light the candle in the house and you do Shabbat Shalom, you do that whole experience, and then you do church on Sunday and you, you obey the Bible and you, don't, and you say your prayers, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name and all of that you are going to be uh, lifted by God and you're going to be protected and you're going to be loved and those who aren't are going to go to hell. And it just was so contradicting. So I think at one point I came to my dad and said, look, I really need to study my shamanism because these powers are getting stronger and they're not going away. So my father said, okay, you can study these things, but you also need to study religion. So you need to go to Christian school and you also can study the shamanism and then you make a decision, you know, where, where you need to be. But I think you should follow Jesus Christ. And I said, yes, I understand that. But 
father Moses was a shaman and he was a part of the Midian tribe, which was Jethro trained him to be a shaman after his wife Zipporah found him and he was able to see the burning bush. So, you know, I see myself more like Moses. I see more, I don't, I see my path of love can open and express itself as Christ, which is to love unconditionally no matter what. But I feel like my path is to lift people out of uh, suppression and oppression. I feel like that's my path, you know? So then you have a lot of that going on in your training, your training, and then your training and understanding. And it really is kind of confusing in the beginning as a kid, because you begin to start questioning who's telling the truth, right? And then my stepmom made it more difficult because my, she convinced my father that I needed to be beat. So there was a lot of abuse in my home. I went through uh, molestation. I had a male babysitter. My dad didn't want women watching us, so he only wanted men watching us. So I had a male babysitter every night molest me. So it was like also wanting to understand his positioning, why he was doing what he was doing to me. Why is my father not protecting me? Why is my dad telling me this is wrong, but then comes in my room and tells me the ancestors spoke to him? Where, why is there so much lies and contradiction? And then I started looking at humanity and seeing the same thing, lies and contradictions. I would go to school and the teacher would have um, a frustration. She was being frustrated while she was teaching the class. And, and I said, to, you know, arguing with your husband at night and bringing that energy into the classroom doesn't make us feel good. And she would pretend like it wasn't, that wasn't the truth. But then when the students would leave, she'd be like, how did you know that? And it was, of course, I knew that because I can see it and everyone can see it. But all the other kids, what I found out from my friends, which I thought was very interesting, is that my friends were programmed. They were told they were not allowed to speak their truth or they're going to get in trouble. And that's the problem that I found was this, this weird rule of fear, initiated fear from the moment you arrive on earth. This initiation of fear. If you do this, this thing will happen. If you, don't, if you don't do what we want you to do, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get grounded. You're going to get whipped. If you, don't, if you don't go and learn what we want you to learn, you're not going to make it in life. You're not going to go to a good college. You're not going to go to a good education. You're not going to make money. You're not going to be able to buy things to feel good and safe and secure. Where did these roles come from? And that was always my dilemma as a child. In, in my shamanic training was this, this, this walk in between the, the, the lies and the deceit and, and, and the, 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 the trickery into that which is organic and love and pure and playful and, and expansive and flourishing. And where do I walk in between that with humanity and my own inner feelings? That was a challenge for me, I think, the most. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Like I, my heart goes out to you for enduring that amount of abuse. And I'm so grateful that you are such a, a, a powerful example, how someone can endure that type of abuse and still be a great and powerful blessing to the world because I feel like some people are being abused now like in the situations of being in the home they're they're being abused and feel like it's the end and they can't get out but I love that you shared your story because I think I feel like that you are proof that you can not only get out but you can own you can also take that and turn it into something golden that can bless so many people so thank you for sharing that story oh thank you for allowing me to share it <laughs> How, and one thing that's, that's a question in my mind, which I know a lot of people struggle with, what, how were you able to forgive? Have you forgiven? And if so, how were you able to forgive? So, you know, I learned in life that when I attempted, and I'm going to say attempted, to forgive my dad and my stepmom for a lot of the things and for the babysitter and, you know, a, a lot of other things that I went through, it didn't stick. It didn't stay that the pain was still there, the suffering was still there, and the need for acknowledgement of that pain was still there. And so I realized that forgiveness is, is, is false. It's not real. It's a, it's a made up um, a game of um, quantum entanglement of like the Chinese finger trap. You know, you both your finger, one side is the person you're wanting to forgive, your side is going in the finger and you try to pull and you both can't get out. And so what I realized 
is that in order for me to truly move on and not perpetuate the abuse to others, because after I went through a lot of that physical abuse, I became an alcoholic. I became addicted to cocaine, crystal meth. Um, I started doing a lot of drugs to stuff and deny the pain that I was feeling while still training in shamanism and understanding the holistic arts. And what was really fascinating to me is one of my elders said to me, I'll never forget her. She's hilarious. She said to me, my aunt said, you, even though you are doing these things, this is your medicine right now. This is your choice. This is your medicine, but it still doesn't stop you from doing your training. And when you decide that you don't need this medicine is when you're going to understand how to support the people who are doing those things. So it was literally not like a slap on the hand or you're being bad. It was more of me being able to realize that I was taking those medicines because I was un not available for myself. I wasn't showing up for myself to acknowledge that it sucked, it was painful, it hurt, but the hurt and the pain is not really from my mom, my, my mom who's my stepmom, and from my dad, and from my mom leaving when I was three, that it was from, the, from another energy that was puppeteering through them. And so when I realized that, that every pain that they inflicted upon me, including my male babysitter, was because they were in pain. And they were telling their story so that they can feel justified for the fact that they went through what they went through. And in order for me to not be like them, which is to inflict that same onto others, I needed to get to a place of acceptance. And that forgiveness was actually making me tied to them on a quantum level. And through acceptance that it was horrible and disgusting and vile and foul and everything you can imagine that could break the human spirit, I accept that they were abusive. I accept that I was molested. I accept that they put me in closets and locked me in rooms for three months and put me in situations where I've had to you know, um, starve and this and that as a way of punishment and beating me until I was bleeding and passing out and throwing up because I couldn't walk anymore because my body was covered in blood from the beating so much. And accepting all of these human atrocities, these, 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 this de devouring and, and degradation of themselves through degrading me. And so I could see the sickness and I could see the, the suffering in them that as they were inflicting this on me, it was justifying for them that this happened to them, but they still didn't come into acceptance with it. So I realized forgiveness is, does not lift me. And it was acceptance that allowed me to truly forgive them. Mm. And then that's how I was able to move from that place of, of you know, uh, being a victim and feeling like life is against me and I remember telling my sister, it was really funny. And I said to her, the more pain they inflict upon me, the deeper into love I'm going to bury myself. So the more I'm going to dig deeper into love and the more pain they inflict, the deeper into love I'm going to bury myself. Whereas some people would say the more pain they inflict on me, the more angry I'm going to become, the more nastier I'm going to become, the more devoid of love I am going to become and the more closed I'm going to become. And that's what darkness wants. Darkness inflicts those things to see if you are ready for the challenge, what you've been set out to, that you can choose to do, it's up to you, to be able to stand in the face of adversity. Shamanic training isn't just for shamans, it's for everyone. The rites of passage is a proclamation of recognizing that you are an eternal being in flesh you didn't come here to ride the Ferris wheel and, 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 and go to the park and have a picnic. Yes, you can do those things. But what you came here for is to confront the darkness that is, that is puppeteering the people. And in order to do that, you're going to have to be able to see beyond the illusion and be able to go beyond the pain, beyond the suffering, beyond the loss and the shame and the guilt and the hate and the this and the that and be able to love greater than all of those circumstances for you to be able to pull yourself into the dark realm and bring your brothers and sisters home. This is, a, this is an evacuation. And so we are here to lift the veil of illusion, 
to create a disturbance within the energetic fields of consciousness that have been held in the linear uh, trajectory of like a conveyor belt of people going down that conveyor belt, giving their life and energy to a system that only wants to take their money, their time and their attention, instead of allowing them to be of service with the wisdom and the grace and the beauty and the geniusness and the creativity and all of that to be able to, 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 to expand our species greater than uh, this planet, to be able to, to literally create a global sphere of consciousness that allows us to live not for the sake of survival, but to live for the sake of evolution and thriving. And so for me to get to that level, my love, it was about the more smacks on the face, the more punches in the stomach, the more kicks, the more uh, knocking me out until I can't, until I lose consciousness. It was like, I got to go deeper with love. That's the only way I'm going to survive. I got to go deeper with love. And my friends and I was crazy. They're like, this, how can you love it when you've gone through so much pain? I said, I got to go deeper. I got to get more vulnerable. I got to rip my, I got to rip myself into the deepest part. I got to pull all my organs out and see what's left or I'm not going to be able to do it. And that's how I make that transition. Wow. That is some powerful love and powerful acceptance. And it also sounds like compassion. Like that's what word was resonating in, in my soul. It's like you have so much, you know, acceptance, like you said, and then compassion for people, because I feel like beyond acceptance, in order not to hold a grudge to someone because it still happened, it, it takes so much compassion to still be around that person, be with that person. And I think that's so important because a lot of people are experiencing trauma in the home, abuse in the home, but they still have to be around that person. But like you said, with that acceptance of, okay, this is a dark energy that's moving through them. Is there any way I can stop this from happening, but also have compassion so that I'm not affected continually affected about around the trauma. And I feel like what, what advice would you give someone who's in it right now, who's experiencing abuse right now? What, what advice would you get them to, to be able to cope with the situation? So the first thing is when you are in abuse, it is an opportunity for you to look at the defining principles of your truth, right? Your truth being that if you are allowing this abuse because you feel like this makes you a greater love for life, because some people choose to be in abuse to say, look at how much I love you. Look at how much I'm willing to put up with. You see, in my situation growing up as a kid, I was a kid. I was surrounded in that abuse until I got to a certain age was like, I'm out, right? But the thing is, there is no tolerance for abuse. The idea of abuse is a sickness. It's an illness on our planet that the people who are saying things to you, I don't even ever worked in a hospital. I've worked in many hospitals in my life and gone in and, you know, and, and the one, one time I was in Turkey working in a hospital in, uh, in the Chantiche, and uh, the woman I was do doing uh, healing with would always tell me I'm ugly and stupid and you're so ugly, you're so ugly, you're so stupid. I, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And her children would say, oh, forgive my mom for saying these things. And I said, Oh, I'm not even taking it in because if you know who you are, which is the key element to your evolution, if you know who you are, you know those words are not meant for you. Those words are only being spoken so you can see the illness. You see, God reveals to you that which must be seen so that love and healing can endure. If we are to respond to the, to the curses and actions of people when they're outside of character, we are, then we are actually saying that these things, actual, these things that I'm experiencing that are affecting me are actually proclaiming me. You see, that's the, the truth of the awareness of spirit is held within the fact that you are an eternal being and that you can change yourself any day, any time, any moment and that you are not held in one form. So if you are not held in one form, why would you choose any words or anything that does not describe the nature of your greatness, your love, your beauty, your strength, your wisdom, your clarity, your graciousness, your sensitivity, your sensuality, your everything? 
to hold that as a truth. So, so when you're in that situation, you have to ask yourself, am I jumping into this person's mud because I think that it makes me a good person? or because I feel like they're gonna come out of this and they're gonna love me more because I went to the mud with them. And that is a giant no. You are not meant to mess up your clothes. You are not meant to jump in the mud. You are meant to be a regal, royal, pristine, uh, sovereign being of the light. That means that you stay with your jewels, your, 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 your beautiful robes, and you stand there and you say, I see that you're having a situation. How can I best serve you? Would you like my support? And if the person says, no, I don't want your support, you step away. That means you're trusting in, their, in the guidance and the will of their being to say no. No matter what they do, you have to be okay with it and know that, that they are owning their own space for themselves in their evolution. If you go in and jump in their mud and then complain that you got dirty, when you chose to jump in their mud, that's on you. Nobody needs to mud wrestle, okay? Mud wrestling does not feel good when you're in the mud. Now standing at the side and throw a life preserver and say, you know, I love you, here's a way out. If you like, I'm gonna be at this amazing party. I have clothes waiting for you to dress yourself and clean yourself off. There's a shower, you know, metaphorically speaking. And you now can come to this party and be a part of this amazing lit, powerful family of light and graciousness and love and food to nourish yourself, music to dance and celebrate life and talk and have conversations that enlighten, inspire and delight so that we as a family can witness each other's power as a community, as a collective and let's rock this planet to where it's supposed to be. Not let me stay in your mud and complain and then tell all my friends how horrible my life is when I keep jumping in your mud. That is the sickness there. The sickness is that when people act at a character, it's a flu. I call it a spiritual flu. So when someone acts something like, someone says something to me, so, oh, you know, Shaman Derek, you this and this and, and so forth. I say, okay, that's fine. You can say what you want to say. And I love you regardless of what you choose to say, because I know that's not you speaking. But right now I see a spiritual flu and I'm not here to be affected by your flu, okay? That's why we have what's happening on the planet right now with the coronavirus. Because nobody wants to take responsibility for the sickness that has been, the, the, the privity, that, the depravity that's been sitting inside of humanity of why we keep destroying our own species, our own planet, our own animals, our own resources, and then acting like it's cool because we got so many followers on Instagram and everybody's um, enjoying the new, the new song that came out and watching what's on Netflix. No, no, no baby booze, no baby booze. So no baby boo, you cannot think just because you are in keeping yourself distracted and focusing on all these things that are non-sequential to the evolution of the species in this planet, that everything is gonna be okay. That's why we're going through what we're going through right now. Because the consciousness has created a dispersing energy, which is so completely off the Richter scale of, of what it means to truly develop our species to the point of annihilating our species and making it so that we can't even inhabit our own selves on the planet. I know people walking around going, save the earth, save the earth, put your signs down. Earth is fine. Earth can freeze over. Earth can change itself and do rearrange itself and do everything. Look, Gaia is fine. Mother Earth, the Terra Sphere is fine. That's not what I'm concerned about as a shaman. What I'm concerned about is the adaptation of our species in connection with the animals and nature and understanding the relationship that God gave us to honor and to be stewards of respect and honor and that we begin to look at how we are either creating or destroying in the nature of our words, our actions, our, our dreams, and the way in which we create as creators. And so, you know, at the end of the day, when people are talking about being in abusive situations, they're choosing to be in abusive situations because somewhere inside, if they're saying, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, that's because they're abusing themselves with lies. You see, the greatest thing that human beings do is to lie to themselves by accepting nonsense as truth. Like if someone says you're an idiot and you get affected by that, then you are lying to yourself, which means you are lying to God. Because whatever you say onto yourself, you say to God because God created you. Just like if you go to an art gallery 
and you look at an artist's um, uh, display of, of art and creativity and you say this is ugly and da 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 da, that's what you're saying about the artist because you're not understanding the blessing of creation that comes through, that births through a person to become, a, to become what it is. That's why I say, love your brothers and sisters, love the planet, love the trees, love the flowers, love everything. If you say you love God, don't go say you love God, then go to church with your Sunday bass, and then you're judging everybody, because then you ain't loving nobody. You're just loving, you're loving the idea, and the idea goes, goes away very quickly. It goes away very quickly, right? Right. Right. That's so powerful. I, I feel like a lot of times we don't really look at it like that, like how we are saying I love you and then the next minute saying something else or degrading something or tearing something down. I, I like, you know, kind of your philosophy. Love is love. Love is just is. Love is compassion. Love is acceptance. Love is awareness. And I feel like I 100% agree with you. And anything outside of that is a different frequency, trying to work itself out. And so what would you have to say? Because there is a lot of transition now with you saying, okay, we have to heal ourselves. So what are some of the things that people can do right now while, where they're at to start that healing process? So even just right there, when we talk about starting the healing process, the healing process has been started with you, with or without you, right? right? So you may not be conscious that you've been going through healing, but all the things that have been driving you crazy and getting under your skin and irritating you and annoying you, that's the healing right there. Because you see, the understanding of healing is always this idea that it's gonna be this blissful, amazing experience. But healing isn't just like that when you have so much resistance and control issues. Healing can sometimes be the fact that you did break up with the, the person left you, because that's healing. You know, you may not see it as a healing. You may see it as like, I can't believe they broke my heart. How could they do this to me? Instead of you saying, thank you, thank you, spirits. Thank you, ancestors. Thank you, God, for bringing, to bringing me salvation and healing at this time in my life to remove this person out of my life, because there are things that I obviously did not see that you saw and was in for my benefit. You see, sometimes one gets a, a, a release from their job. They think, oh my God, this is a horrible thing that happened. Instead of saying, thank you, thank you, let's have a, let's have a, uh, I lost my job party or a breakup party, but we can just, you know, people come over, we have some music, some food, people can bring you gifts to, 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 to bring like a acknowledgement of the, of the path that you're heading on. You see, we keep utilizing the idea of suffering and the idea of pain in this very, uh, we add verbs to it. We give it, we give it definition, but our definition is always against ourselves. We don't realize that everything is happening that's painful and uncomfortable is because we're in, we're in resistance. We're in control with it. We don't want to let go of it. Spirit's saying, get this. Th we, we can't have this here no more. We got to pull this away. You're like, no. You said, pull this away. No, let go. Pull this away. And then spirit goes, let it go. You know, and out of love. And people don't like that. They don't understand right. that healing's already happening. If you're going through challenging situations, you're in healing. That's good. Sometimes when I'm out in the public and I see people acting strange around me, they don't know how to handle my energy because I'm really big personality and I'm energy. And I start breaking out in salsa, doing all kinds of things that may make them feel uncomfortable. I don't care. Be uncomfortable, shake in your boots, throw up in a bucket, whatever you got to do, because if my presence showing up makes you go through that, that's healing, baby. That's how we look at it in shamanism. That is so powerful. And I want to embody and take on some of your confidence and your comfortability in your skin, because, you know, I have a level of that, but it's something that I personally have struggled with, like standing in my power speaking my truth, allowing my voice to be heard, because especially as a woman, it's like, sit down, shut up. No, you didn't. No, you won't. You know, and I've so, for so long, I, you know, stay quiet and stay small. So, cause I, so, cause I didn't want to make people uncomfortable. And I <laughs> love just hearing you speak because it's like, it doesn't matter how small I try to be. I'm still going to make people uncomfortable anyway. So I might as well just stop. Trying to play small. Exactly. Exactly. You have to be what is called the woman's rebel. Okay. A woman's rebel is everything you were told to do, you do the opposite. 
<laughs> if you are, if you people tell you not to make people uncomfortable, your job is to be a loving interruption and ruffle some feathers. Because when you ruffle feathers, you create healing. When you make people uncomfortable, you bring out their, their, their the poison that's inside them. You see, you don't you you know it, it's like it's like it's like what Martin Luther King said. It's it's not the fact that he was upset with the people who were not speaking up. It was the fact that he was upset with the people who knew there was something wrong and they didn't speak up. You see, right. that's where we, we become so complacent and so sedentary in our ways on earth. We think someone else is going to do it. No. Well, Your you know, that brings up a good point because even right now, like there's some people speaking up about the corruption and about things going in the world. And then their very friends are like, you don't know that and how can you say that and like i actually you know gave my opinion of what i think is true and what feels true in my body and someone like you know goes on my podcast like i can't believe you're spreading knives and like tears me apart so in that when it's so much confusion there's so much lies going around people don't know what to believe what is your advice for people in this time where even people with good intentions well meaning are so manipulated and confused maybe i'm manipulated and confused hell i don't know you know there's just so much going on right now like can you speak to that energy and what you do to deal with that energy well first of all i don't even deal with that energy because at the end of the day i live my life by observing and experiencing and what, what like you know people talking about uh, you know, what they're doing to the kids and what this Clintons are doing and what this person's doing and that person's doing and see she and he he and Sanchuan and Bob and Sue and Mary Jo and Taniqua and, and you know, and, and Rayul and all these people. I don't know these people. I don't know them. Right. So I ain't gonna talk about them because I don't know them. You understand? But what I do know, that's what I'm gonna talk about. And right. if people wanna share that message, then they need to be comfortable with other people not agreeing with their message because guess what? There's many sides to a coin. You know, when someone tells a story, someone says something, oh, this person's talking, I hear them, I'm, I'm at a gathering, and this person's talking and so forth. I'm never going to say to that person, no, that's not true. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Because what you perceive is completely different from what another person perceives based on their life experience and the food that they ate, the toys they played with, the parents they grew up with, and their geographical location. Let's not, let's not play, right? So who am I to tell you that what you are seeing is incorrect? What I'll say is, and to add to that, let me share this. Do, 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 do. And to add to that, let me share this. And let it be a global conversation of points and ideas and conversation, not a debate, not a you're wrong and I'm right. That's the whole reason why we're in this mess in the beginning because everyone's stuck in duality. You're right, I'm wrong. This polarity over this polarity. Men versus women, gay versus straight, this versus that, black versus white. Look, this ain't no verse nothing. This is about understanding, relating. Doesn't mean you have to agree, but to listen and to share, let people say what they wanna say. But for me, on my end, I hear what I hear and so forth, but I have to ask myself, is me sharing this information actually focus on what I am here to present from the, the authenticity of my being. If it's not, I, and, as I don't know, you know, sometime one, one time I was at a dinner table with, uh, with Keanu Reeves and he asked me this question about Olivia Newton John. I'll never forget this day. So I was with my girlfriend who was his um, sister. And I said, so you mean it's, he said, so what do you think about Olivia Newton John's um, husband jumping off the boat? And everyone looked at me on the dinner table. My girlfriend looked at me. I said, nothing. He goes, what? I said, nothing. He goes, you, you don't have an opinion about it? I said, I don't know the man. I don't know Olivia. I don't know these people. I don't know these people from Tuesday's bread to, to, to Monday's uh, morning porridge. All I know is what is going on in my life. So why am I even gonna talk about some people I don't even know? That's mm -hmm. the problem. People are nosy. People have all up in everyone's business. Look, you can share information if you want to. That's your choice. Be as you choose to be. Put your energy where you choose to put your energy. But if someone fires back at you, that if you are strong in what you believe, just be like, you know what? It's okay. You believe what you believe. I believe what I believe. It doesn't diminish either or or any way. But the thing is, if you're getting affected because you say something and someone says something back at you, 
That's because you are not solid in what you believe. So then if you're not solid in what you believe, zip the lip. Don't talk. Mm. Focus on what you know. And that way you grow. And that's how you help other people to grow because you are, you're grounded. You know, that's what I love about being a melanated brother because you get grounded in those roots. Roots, you root it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think that's so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think a lot of times, like you said, you tell one person a secret and by the time it gets to the fifth person, it's completely different. And I think that's such great advice. If it's not you, if it, not, it doesn't concern you, then what can you say about it if you weren't there and you don't know that person? And I, and I totally, like, totally am down with that vibe. And I always say when people tell me stuff I'm like if it's not me and it's not to do with me I have to I would have to talk to that person to understand or even have to have an opinion right um, but I feel like when it comes to the government our governor officials our election coming up we don't know these people but these we got to vote for these people and these people are running the world and people like go out and vote and so a lot of the things that are going around is like okay we're in this state of and you know, you know, I mean, maybe you don't have an opinion on this and that's an opinion, but we're in this state of like, we have to, we, we have leaders, you know, and those leaders are affecting what's going on. Like those leaders are affecting us being our in our home or out of our home. Right. So when it comes to that, how can one live in alignment, live in love, love consciousness, awareness, obsess, um, you know, but also acceptance, but also make a decision on what reality do I want to experience? And if I want to experience that reality, what can I do right now to help manifest that? Okay, well, first of all, Martin Luther King had a dream, okay? And his dream was for social equality and for us to be able to sit and have food and commune with our other brothers and sisters um, who are white, okay? And people at that time, when he said his dream, his own color skinned people of melanated skin tone told him he was crazy. Brother man, you know good and well, ain't nobody gonna let us sit down with no white folks. We ain't gonna be on no white folks table. We ain't gonna be in no white folks restaurant. And we most certainly ain't gonna be going to the bathroom with no white folks. Okay, so let's get that dream out of your head. You, you know, we hear everything what you're saying in church, man. But you know what? I gotta tell you, no white folks ain't gonna let us sit down with them. That's the kind of stuff he was hearing. But see, when you have a dream and you have an understanding, you don't, you're not doing it for other people to believe in you. You are holding the dream so that spirit can move through you. You see, the element that we are facing on earth is that human beings still think that these leaders have power. They only have power because the collective is disenfranchised. You see, human beings have disenfranchised themselves and separated themselves and, and separated and, and, and discriminated and created all these types of uh, social issues that they can't come together like it was in the 70s. You see, when, when, when those leaders were making choices in the 70s, people said, oh, no, we're going to have a group and that group's going to, we're going to share with another group and we're all going to get on the same page and say, no, we are not doing this anymore. Why hasn't that happened anymore? I'll tell you why. Because in the 80s and into the 90s, we started putting our powers into election, uh, elected officials, into all of these people who are doing all of these, uh, running all of these, uh, you know, uh, what you call it, campaigning, into Wall Street's hands, into to CEOs' hands, into corporations' hands. We started bowing down to the corporations where in the 70s and the 60s, they were like, oh no, this is about community. This is about people standing with each other, marching against things, saying, no, we're gonna boycott you. We're not gonna put our energy there. Then these people have no power. It's like what I told women in Turkey when I was doing all this uh, uh, women's love focus uh, in Turkey to help women to really see and hold space for their power. Mm. I said, you as a Muslim woman, may think you have no power, but there you are mistakenly wrong. You see, because if you don't go home today and you don't get food on the table and you don't be what you have been and you were to walk out tomorrow, your husband would lose his mind. He wouldn't know what to do with the, with the kids. He wouldn't know what to do with himself. He wouldn't know which side is up and which side is upside down. 
So you have the power. You need to remind yourself of that. And right. the Turkish woman, Muslim woman, looked at me and she said, you're right. I'm going to strike. I'm going <laughs> to, I, Shaman Durek, I, I, I'm going to tell my husband I'm not lifting a finger until things change or that's it. And she called me on the phone and said her husband was like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? This is not the way. And she said, this is the way. Either we make some changes in this house. I am not your servant. You don't come home and put your feet on the table and expect me to bring you some tea. And then you have sex with me when you want to have sex with me when you desire it and not look at me as a goddess, as a woman and who brought children into this world. I will walk out this door and you will be left with nothing. You see, women are the cornerstones of society. Now, if women are the cornerstone of society and they say, we say in shamanism, if you want to see the state of the planet, take a look at women. And if you want to know what's going on in nature, if you want to know what's going on in nature, look at women. You want to know what nature's feeling, look at what's happening to women. Because women are the cornerstones of society. Now, people are the cornerstones of government. They are the ones who are deciding what's going on. But if they're going to act so disconnected, like, like what I talk about in my uh, book, Spirit Hacking, where I talk about circuses and bread, Caesar said something very interesting that I had to put in that book. And government has been following this for the longest time. Keep the people entertained. Mm. Keep them eating cheap bread and give them the gladiators. They will never know what the Republic does. This is from Caesar's mouth to the Republic. So they put, the, they put all the entertainment, poured through bread at people in the, in, the, in the thing, and people are like eating the bread, woo! And they're like, ah! They're laughing and stuff the whole time. Caesar's just running and taking over country, over country, over country, over country, not even knowing what's going on because the people are so distracted. The way to disperse people is to keep them distracted on superficial things that have no value, no principle, and no understanding of the power and the likeness of their beings as children of God. If you can keep people so disconnected from the reality of who they are, then you can rule over them, you can control them, you can feed them whatever you want and they'll eat it. You can tell them, watch this, buy this. If you don't have this, something's wrong with you. If you don't get that new Gucci bag, you're not going to be acknowledged in society. If you don't buy those, if you don't buy those, those um, batons, those uh, was Louis Vuitton, whatever they call it nowadays. I don't know, a red bottom, this is a green bottom, <laughs> blue bottom, I don't know. Everybody got a new bottom, some got a new Woo! bottom, I don't know. The point I'm making is, you don't have that, you no one's going to see you as a respectable person. You don't have this car, you don't have this, you don't have that. This is all a, a masquerade of the conveyor belts. You say, we put animals on conveyor belts, chickens and cows and pigs, and we slaughter them. They do the same to us, but they make us believe we're free because we can take a trip to Hawaii and go to, and go to Bali for a week or two weeks. That's not freedom. That's tossing you a bone. That's not, that's not real freedom. True freedom is liberation. Liberation is knowing that no one has power over you. You see... What's happening right now is not the government keeping us in our homes. It's spirit keeping us in our homes. Because spirit needs you some time to do some germination. You gotta, we need to do some intro, intro, uh, introspection. We need to do some, some uh, looking and seeing how we've been utilizing our energy as a creative source on this planet. What is valuable to you people? What is valuable to you? Having a big house and a car so everyone thinks that you're, so you can get love? having many followers on Instagram so everybody can love on you when you don't even respond to people's messages when you're on Instagram live, people talking and talking, you're just talking at them, talking and talking and talking. You're not even looking down and going, oh yes, Susie, you said da 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 Community, 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 collective, collective, community, collective, community, collective, community. By God, we will take back the system if we get ourselves into alignment. Woo, mic drop. Okay, that, that, I, I could talk to you forever, but I respect your time. And that was just like a whole word. And I 100% agree, like we have to get back to self-love and oneness and living in alignment with Mother Earth. And that's, a. I love the way you put it, spirit has us in our home because it's easy to, you know, put power somewhere else. But at the end of the day, spirit is all powerful. And at the end of the day, that is what we want to align ourselves with. You know, I like to say, you know, 
I'm not a victim, I'm a creator. So what can we create at this time? And like you said, what we can create is a stronger relationship with who we really are, our mm. spiritual centers, our souls. And um, okay. I'm excited. I'm excited about everyone getting your book and uncut, you know, just unpacking spirit hacking because you have a lot of amazing nuggets in that book that have helped me with my life personally, just really in a non-judgmental way. But I love, I love the way you kind of make it fun and just kind of <laughs> keep it real because, you know, spirituality doesn't have to be so hard. And I think a lot of people have experienced, you know, spirituality being so hard and so judgmental. But what I like the way that you put things in spirit hacking is just like, no, this is the facts. And you could be with this or you could be with that. But this is what you're going to experience when that happens. And I just love how matter of fact you are. So um, as we kind of wrap things up, you know, and I just have a... Like, and even like, because um, I know you wanted to touch on my relationship. So... You know, I know a lot of people have different ideas when it comes to love, you know, and I know you've had a very public relationship. So with that relationship, I know you share a lot about, you know, relationship and connection and codependency. Can you share a little bit about like as we're rubbing up just about relationship and, and how that's been for you? I've been in a lot of tumultuous relationships in the past uh, in, 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 in both respects to men and women because I've been I'm I'm uh, what I call soul sexual person. So I, I made it an agreement early in my life that I'm attracted to love and energy and spirit. And it doesn't matter how the body, how the body shows up. And so, you know, I've been in a lot of tumultuous relationships, relationships that were based in, you know, like uh, codependency and like, I'm going to put up with your abuse because don't you see I'm here for you and I love you and all this kind of stuff. And you know, and, and everyone goes into this like, oh, my twin flame, my soulmate and all this new age stuff. I'm just not really into all of that in that level because I believe that your twin flame can come to anybody that it wants to come. It can come to 100 people if it needs to. The point I, I, I look at is your ability to be appreciative of the person who triggers you. You see, because a lot of times in relationships, people think a great relationship is someone who just goes along with everything they say. I mean, I mean, and, and we can even just look at it from my relationship perspective, right? So my relationship perspective is I'm dating a member of the royal family, okay? A princess. And when I first met her, the first thing that came in my mind is like, okay, like, how am I going to, you know, like, what's this going to be like? You know, how is this going to, like, how, how are our lives going to come together? I'm a shaman. She's a royal princess. She's connected to the royal family in England, Spain, and all these different, they're all her cousins. You know, it's a big family. So, but then all of a sudden, Spirit said to me, yeah, but you are regal. You come from the perspective of the rooted energy of Africa. You are the, you are the, the, the first regal. So you need to step into that space and remove all of that nonsense. And the lesson that I learned in this relationship when we first started dating, because it was a challenge in the beginning, because the paparazzi are always following us. There's never really privacy. We're being recorded, taped, um, you know, observed by spies. People who want to like tear us apart will try to do little trickeries. You know, the other day we got a death threat talking about they want to take our lives, you know, because they can't, just one person can't believe that, you know, I, that she's with a, a, a melanated brother and, sh and she's an Aryan princess. And, you know, people got their issues. And it's not just in, in people who are white. I get messages from people in, in, in melanated community who are like, how could you choose to be with this white devil? You know, everyone's got something to say. You know, people have something to say about Kanye and, 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 and the Kardashians. Like, you don't know what someone's love is. But it's an interesting thing that when you're in a relationship and you're on blast because you're a public figure and you're always on the press, always in the newspaper, always someone's got something to write about you. Every day I pick a, I mean, I can look every day and I can find something about me that they're saying. And the reality is it doesn't matter what anyone says about your relationship. What matters is what you say and who you are. And when I'm in a relationship with, with um, my girlfriend, every time she brings something to the table, I don't look at her as my enemy. I look at her as an opportunity for me to be more vulnerable. So when she says something that I need to make correction in, or she's drawing it to my point, or even if she's yelling and getting upset, the first thing I always say is, um, what do you need from me right now? How best can I hold space for you right now? And then shut up. Because the thing is, is that what I learned with, with women is women have such deep wisdom. 
sometimes us men like to use our, our patriotic nonsense and speak over women and not let women give us the wisdom and the guidance that we need. And so what I've learned in relationships is that if that person is in your life, doesn't matter if it's male or female, I don't care who it is, you need to trust that you chose them because they can see your weaknesses and they can see your vulnerabilities. So when they say something, they're not, they're not here to hurt you. They're here to lift you. And so you simply say, thank you for sharing that, showing that to me. Now, let me go into the room and scream in a pillow because I'm pissed off that you shared that with me. Let's be real about it. And then I'm going to look at my trigger and see like what the real issue is. It's not about you. It's about me. What is the thing that I haven't healed in myself or brought perspective upon that is keeping me reactive? And, and, and angry and upset and whatnot. So utilizing that. So that's what really creates a real partnership is when you're able to say, you know what? This is not a codependency. This is, I see you in your power. You see me in my power. If I'm vulnerable and weak and need to, like sometimes my girlfriend will say, honey, I'll be like, babe, I need you to open your arms. I'm coming in for a deep cry. I'm gonna cry for like two hours. I'm like, in so much pain right now and sadness. Can you just hold me? And she's like, yeah. Or if I do something that's not, because, you know, being with her, the royal princess, there's all these rules that, that have now been indoctrinated on my life, okay? So, you know, I see Megan trying to run, you know, she running because she knows, because I feel it. And I'm just like, you know, it's intense. It's intense, okay? So right. the thing is, is like, you know, you want to fit into doing the right thing when you're with the royal family and also making the people in the country happy with you, but you can't make everyone happy. There's always going to be people who just don't like you because you're with the princess. They don't like you because you're with their prince and you're a commoner. And especially because I'm melanated and, oh, and I'm a shaman. Oh, and I'm so sexual. Oh, 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 they're tripping. Mm. So the thing is, you just kind of step into a place where you insulate your truth with love and you build on that relationship, not as a working prog a, a work that you have to work through, but through an acceptance of vulnerability to be stronger because it is the humbleness and the humility that edifies you, not your strength and your walls and your armor that edifies you. You don't get edified by pretending to be strong and pretending to have some false sense of security because God always wants to refine you and God will refine you in your relationships. That's the best place for a refinement. So when people don't have a relationship, it's because they don't, they don't feel comfortable letting someone in to see their deep vulnerability. So if you can't let someone in to see your deep vulnerability, you are not going to be in a relationship, period. I love that. that is so deep. Thank you for sharing such personal stories about your relationship. I feel when we share our stories, we really do let people in so they can see it's not all unicorns and rainbows, but it's a lot of work. And it's mm -hmm. a lot of, especially when you have like a dynamic relationship like yours, and I also know you like to talk about a lot about codependency. A lot of people get in relationships and they feel like, okay, this relationship completes me. How important it is, how important is it to you to have your own space? Okay. From all aspects of life, autonomy and being in the nucleus of your own being is so necessary for you to be able to hold space for another person. If I went into a relationship, like for instance, you know, a lot of people will say about my girlfriend that I'm the shaman who put a spell on her. Why would a princess ever choose a shaman and a man who's melanated and who's so sexual and all this stuff? There ain't no spell put on her. She's a woman who just got tired of dating princes and other people who just pull the paper down and look at her and say, honey, she's talking about her dreams and the people pulling the paper down going, uh, yeah, honey, that's nice. Okay, are we going horseback riding? No, she wants someone who's like, I'm here to hold space for you because I'm comfortable within my own space. I don't need to infringe upon your wisdom because by me infringing upon your wisdom, I'm infringing upon my own wisdom. Your eyes, our eyes, we have four eyes now. We have four ears. We have four ears now. We are being able to hold space to see into each other's dimension and support one another. If codependency is in there, there is no support. If codependency is in there, it's hierarchy, it is power struggle, and the power struggle is not with the other person, it's with yourself. 
It's the same in spirituality. It's like me telling people, I'm Shaman Durek and I'm all powerful and all knowing and you guys need to learn how to do this and this and this. Uh, 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 uh. Now, hierarchy and guruism and come to me and I have all the answers. When people come to me and ask me a question. I'm like, and what do you think? Because if you don't know how to get in your own autonomy, you're not gonna, go, you're not gonna come on me and make me responsible for how you choose to, to orchestrate your life. I don't wanna stand next to people who are, who are bowing down to me and being yes people. I wanna stand next to leaders. I wanna stand next to revolutionaries. I wanna stand next to people who are edge makers, taste makers, people who know how to stand in their own deliverance of their own energy. Bring me something to the table because I wanna, we wanna have a feast. I don't wanna be the only one providing food on the table. Okay, mm. I want mm. to have a buffet. Bring your buffet. I'll bring my buffet. We're going to have a party. But to be codependent and to act as if someone is completing you, no one completes me. The only thing that completes me is my relationship with God. Mm. That completes mm. me. Mm. You think you're going to come in here and complete me? You don't, you, 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 you trying to complete me. And I'm going to say trying, that's as far as you're going to get. You ain't going to get to do, you just get, get trying. That's it. You like in limbo. You like stuck, like pause, like frozen. Because that's all you can do. Because you can't go any further from, because when you stick and trying, you're in limbo. You're like frozen. You can't even move to the finish line. Because the moment you try to complete me is the moment you just lost yourself. And if you lost yourself and I'm codependent and I'm supposed to be getting completed by you, I just de got depleted by you. While you trying to complete me, you just deplete me. Mm, that is so powerful. That is so powerful. And wow, I, I think that in and of itself, people can draw a lot from that and realize that, you know, outside of the control you know, and the codependency, if you can just love a person for who they are, what they have to say, then it, it, love is love. And that leads me to my last question for you. What is love to you? First of all, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you and value you. And I'm so grateful for you showing up every day for yourself and for the world. So I just want to say that because when it comes up, I got to say it. You know, you don't hold back. Never hold yes. back. You feel like running across the room and kiss your lover. You run. <laughs> <laughs> thank you you know what i'm saying i appreciate like, that i, I chopped down a rose bush once for my girlfriend and put roses all over the house and my neighbor was like i, I know it wasn't the best thing to do because my neighbor had prized roses and i chopped down her tree but i was a dysfunctional kid at the time i was a teenager you know but, but my neighbor had the cops over and they were looking at the rose bush where's my roses and my girlfriend said are these the roses that you took down from her yard i said baby i pulled the moon down for you <laughs> take the, I'll oh. take the light out of the sky for you <laughs> <laughs> Talk about love. You sound like a romantic for sure. So love, what is love to me? Love to me is acceptance. Love to me is allowing people to be as they choose to be without you needing to change them, rearrange them, improve them, or move them. Love is, I love you because you were created. The fact that God created you, do you know how, how, how much energy in the universe it takes to create one soul? And if people realize how much it takes to make one soul, it's like me going to you and saying, Koya, I want you to hold on to this, um, this box. Inside this box is the most sacred and precious gift. There's only one that exists throughout the whole universe. And I need you to, to watch over it. You're not going to throw it in the trash can. You might even put it in a glass encasing saying, Shaman Derek came over and told me this is only one of a kind. This thing is worth so much value. There's, this thing has no price because that's how valuable it is. Like, you're not going to let anyone even touch it. You're going to be so, 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 so nurturing and so, so in reverence of this gift. Well, that is exactly what each person represents that has been created, represents that is that you are one of a kind. There is no one like you. There never will be. You can mathematically look at it in every calculus, trigonometry, every way. You will never be here again as you. That means that in order for that to happen, they would have to duplicate every food you ate, every song you listened to, every sunrise and sunset you experienced, the way the wind touched you at a certain time, it would have to be duplicated to the T every word that was ever given to you by people, your school teacher, friends, and, and authority figures, whomever, every heart that got broken, every pain that you went through, they would have to duplicate that. And that's not possible. That means that you are one of a kind. 
You are that, that beautiful gift that has come in that beautiful package. And God is saying, this is one of a kind. This is more valuable than anything that you could ever forge with your hands. And no matter how much money you could print, no matter how many cars you could buy, no matter how many houses you can proclaim for yourself, claim for yourself, no matter how much riches you could dig out of the earth, you will never be able to touch the value and worth of this. So why would I or yourself choose to degrade that which is so sacred? To mm. me, that is love. Wow. That is profound, first of all, and thank you so much. This has been such a juicy treat to have you on, sharing your wisdom, sharing your soul, sharing everything that you are. So I highly suggest everyone check out your book, Spirit Hacking, and do you have anything else to share with us where you can be found and where people can enjoy a little bit more of what you have to offer the world? You can find me on Instagram. I do a lot of uh, giveaways, financial giveaways to help people during the time of coronavirus. I do Tuesday, Tuesday. We do a lot of fun stuff to keep you active in your, in your abilities. Uh, you know, there's so many things. Everything I do, I think about how to keep the power in your hands, how to make you your own awareness of yourself. Everything I'm sharing with you is not a teaching. It's a remembrance. Remember, whatever I lay before you is just me saying to you, do you remember this? Do you remember this until you remember? I am not your teacher. I am not your guru. I am not your saint. I am not anything. I am here. I'm not any of those things. I am something, but I am something that is in each and every one of us, which is I am the embodiment of creation in this embodiment as you are in your embodiment. And I have much to learn from you as we have to, to, for me to learn from me. And the learning is not a learning, but a remembrance. And so when we understand that this is about a remembrance that we are sharing, every time we share knowledge, it's about remembering. That's all we're doing is we're jogging each other's memory. And to acknowledge that and to know that there is no hierarchy, there's no higher self. The higher self is here with you right now, waiting for you to take notice and acknowledge and proclaim. I am grateful to each and every one of you for all the things that you are doing to show up for yourself, to nourish yourself, to love yourself, to provide for yourself, all that you need to see you in the likeness of God in embodiment. And I am so honored and I clap and celebrate every day for each and every one of you to show you are demonstrating to the world every time you love and give yourself and nurture yourself and tell yourself beautiful words, you are bringing healing and transformation to the world. That is all I need to say. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for sharing your love with us. And you all, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I feel like I just got loved up. So remember, love yourself, love each other, and love the world. One day at a time, one breath at a time. Peace and love.